Okay. Hello, guys. Uh, it's July 1, 2022, and you're watching the Free Friday class. It is the first half of 2022. Let's begin. All right. So for the first half of 2022, we will just evaluate first the price movements of what happened this year. You could see that there is a clear outperformance within Chinese stocks. You could see um, just from a simple glance that the Chinese EVs or the Chinese electric vehicles have been outperforming. This was a case of the government doing a lot of monetary easing. And you could see that the strongest performance comes from Li Auto, ticker symbol LI, up 25% year to date and up 40% year on year with monthly gains of at least 50%. Now, we're also seeing a lot of short covering in your Chinese education stocks like Tal, Edu. You're seeing that rise 25% year-to-date from being down 78% last year. Take note that most education firms were actually said to be um, not possible to do after-school tutoring, rendering them to be non-profit organization. They had to um, step up in pivoting their uh, companies into e-commerce names and doing live stream education. In terms of live streaming, Kwai Show or another um, competitor of TikTok is up 20% year to date. You're seeing Chinese brokerage firm Futu up 20% year to date. Another Chinese car company, BYD, is up 18% year to date. You've got Chinese e-commerce firms like Pintuatua up 6%. Chinese casinos like Galaxy and Chinese consumer um, restaurants like Heidi Lao up 5%. You're seeing that Macau casinos remain open despite the COVID lockdowns in China. And you're seeing that strong outperformance come out with Alibaba, JD, all of these southern, Chinese southern airlines, even Yum China, all rising. So in general, we are really seeing outperformance in China, including their banks like ICBC. We will go through their charts later on. For now, let's just skim through all the strong and all the weak performances of the year. We could see that this year's weak performance in crypto continues with Solana down 80%, Bitcoin Cash down 76%, Ethereum also down 71%, NEO down 67%, Litecoin down 65%, Ripple down 62%, Bitcoin and Binance one of the more outperformers for cryptocurrency. However, they are still down half year to date. In the last three years, however, you have a very different picture. Those who continue to have their Ethereum, Bitcoin, and Binance for the last three years are still up. For Binance, still up 6x. For Bitcoin, up 80%. For Bitcoin, uh, for Ethereum, they're still up 3x. So um, a very different picture if you are um, early in your Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance versus if you are just um, investing or trading with it for just a year. So uh, crypto continues to be sold down massively and you are seeing the same thing happen towards all Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin miners like Marathon Digital, Hot Mining, Riot Blockchain, BitFarms are down between 77 to 83% year to date. For the last three years, however, some of them are up 50% and 90% still despite that year to date drop. Now, of course, everyone knows that the crypto exchange Coinbase has been um, an IPO disaster, down 81% year to date and continuing to lay off a lot of employees. Now, the banks like Silvergate, a crypto-focused bank who has lent money towards MicroStrategy, um, they are down 64%. And you are seeing MicroStrategy down 70%. That is an underperformance between Bitcoin. So we all know that Bitcoin is a massive holding of MicroStrategy. Owning Bitcoin, however, would have lost 56% year-to-date. Owning MicroStrategy would have lost more, down 70% year-to-date, showing to you that MSTR hasn't been mirroring Bitcoin. In fact, it has been dropping further than Bitcoin. Now, um, in this year, there is an outperformance, of course, of oil and dividend yield stocks like uh, telecom firms. You're seeing Brent Oil is up 40% year to date in the last six months, and it is up 80% over the last three years since the pandemic lows. Your AT&T, which is your telecom provider, is up 13% year to date. 
your Uniqlo or fast retailing in Japan is up 4.5%. A toy company like Mattel is up 3.5%. Gold is slightly down this year, just down 2%, and is still an outperformer over the last three years, up 27%, showing that between gold and Bitcoin, gold has indeed become a better safe haven, although in the last three years, it would be a difference. Bitcoin being up 90% over the last three years, and gold only up 27% over the last three years. So there's more volatility in Bitcoin, and there's also more gains. Now, in terms of Chinese large caps, although um, your I shares and your um, Chinese A shares are outperforming this year, take note that Chinese large caps are still down 20% three years ago, whereas Chinese A shares have recovered at least 20% up three years from, uh, th from three years ago. You have a strong outperformance with cybersecurity names, despite Palo Alto Networks down 11% year to date. For the last three years, Palo Alto Networks continue to remain a growth stock and continues to be elevated with a 140% gain over the last three years and 30% gain over the last year. Japanese stocks are also mostly outperforming the world with the dollar yen weakening or rather um, weakening by 18%. Therefore, these Japanese stocks while up year to date from a currency devaluation standpoint, it may paint a different picture. So most of the Japanese stocks over the last three years contribute 25, 30, 70 percent gains, whether it be Nissin Foods, Yoshinoya, Ajinomoto, QP being down 5 percent over the last three years. But Family Mart continues to be up 18 percent. Kikoman, that, that soy sauce is up 53 percent last three years. However, take note that there is a strong devaluation of the dollar yen such that these gains are muted. Uh, with that 18% devaluation for this year and a 25% devaluation over the last three years. So these um, Japanese companies are just mostly holding their gains versus the devaluation. E-commerce suffered a lot this year, although Amazon outperformed them by shedding only half the sector average. Amazon is down 36% year to date. Shopify, Wayfair, C Limited is down 70 to 80 percent. Your Etsy is down 66 percent year to date. Mercado Libre is down half year to date. However, in the last three years, it paints a, a very different picture. Over the last three years, most of the e-commerce names continue to eke out again, albeit tw quite small. Um, Amazon is up 10 percent over the last three years. Mercado Libre unchanged, up 2% over the last three years. Etsy still up 16% for the last three years. C Limited continues to be up 90% for the last three years. Shopify is unchanged for the last three years. The reason why we're looking at the last three years is because in 2019, prior to the pandemic, some of these companies actually are doing well, and you can buy them in the prices Three years ago, prior to the pandemic, even as their sales revenues and their customers have already grown by a mile. For instance, C Limited, Shopify, in our view, is worth looking at even your Etsy because their revenues continue to go up and their users have grown, especially during the pandemic, and has not actually left the system, even as the share prices have gone down 70 to 80 percent year to date. Now, alternative meat and healthy options have dwindled as a fad. You could see that IPO companies like Sweet Greens, Beyond Meat, down 64% year to date. And furthermore, Beyond Meat has been down 85% in the last three years, suggesting that alternative meat hasn't really picked up any traction, even as Beyond Meat scored very good points with all of your fast food restaurants like McDonald's, Yum Brands, for instance, even Chinese Alibaba partnering on a supermarket um, to sell their goods. Now you're seeing Oatly, also a disastrous IPO, down 85% for the year. Uh, sorry, down 85% year on year and down 60% year to date. We could see that in general, IPOs like Kura Sushi and Dutch Brothers also down 40%. So none of the IPOs actually did well. 
And over the last three years, even as Shake Shack, the hamburger company, also down 40% in the last three years. The only names that managed to be strong in the, um, in the fast food chain scenario has been Domino's Pizza. Domino's Pizza and Papa John's are still up 87% and 40% uh, in the last three years, same for Chipotle, up 80% for the last three years. We could argue that these three companies um, have been doing well, mostly on the takeout delivery segment, as we've seen pizza delivery and burrito delivery doing very well. So e-commerce tied to this fast food restaurant has prevented these three companies to fall um, with the rest of the market or even if they've fallen, it has been less than the average. Uh, Papa John's is down 37% year to date. You've got Chipotle down 25% year to date. Domino's Pizza down 30% tracking the indices. Now, um, it is interesting to also note that your fast food chains such as Yum China in China is actually up. For the last three years, down, up 9%. You've got Chinese fast food chains like um, and Chinese -like restaurants like Luckin Coffee and Heidi Lao actually outperforming with a 30% and a 4% increase despite being down massively three years ago. So you're really seeing the pickup of a lot of Chinese-related restaurants and firms. At the same time, you've got resiliency on McDonald's, a fast food consumer staple. Still up 18% three years ago and just down 8% year to date. That is also a massive outperformance for QSR or Burger King, the owner of Popeye's Kitchen, the owner of um, the owner of also of Tim Hortons. They are down 17% year to date. However, in the last three years, um, although they're down 27%, that is already still an outperformance versus the rest of the fast foods. Yum Brands, which owns your Pizza Hut and KFC, is up slightly unchanged for the last three years, even if it is down 18% year to date. The, um, the anomaly, if you would call it, is Texas Roadhouse. Texas Roadhouse for the last three years is up 40% in terms of casual restaurants, and it is just down 18% year to date, tracking the strength of some fast food chains in the world. Now, high growth tech, tech SaaS firms multiples are down massively. You've got um, a mixed picture here. Twilio is huge, uh, is big, huge, uh, down 70%. You've got Cloudflare, Snowflake, UiPath down 60%. The ones that are winning over the last three years on the multiple uh, on the tech SaaS firms are a few. They are MongoDB, still up 68% over the last three years. You've got Zoom Video, still up 26% in the last three years, showing its resiliency, um, especially even after the pandemic. Um, you've got companies like Magnite. This is a small company that is helping a lot of the um, supply for advertising, still up 36% in the last three years. Viva Systems continues to be strong, 18% up in the last three years. However, most of these tech firms have dropped from 20% to 70% year to date, slashing their huge gains over the last three years. Now, in terms of gaming firms, the only M&A gaming firms were saved from the bloodbath. We know that Activision Blizzard is um, acquired by Microsoft. We know that Zynga is also um, already acquired by, I believe it was Take-Two. So these gains have been preserved. Zynga and Activision Blizzard up 28% and 17% year to date and up massively over the last three years, 30% and 60%. In terms of gaming firms that were also saved are the Japanese firms. You've got Nintendo, Square Enix, and Bandai Namco up 6 uh, six to 7% this year and up massively about 40, 60, 80% in the last three years. Take note that Japanese companies are up, although from a uh, dollar yen perspective, it is highly likely that what's happening in Japan is the weaker yen has been um, saving their uh, companies from the bloodbath. Take note that Japanese yen has devalued 25% in the last three years, making these stocks relatively cheaper um, from a dollar perspective. 
Now, of course, if you're just looking in the Japanese yen, um, it has outperformed, in fairness, um, for Bandai up 80%, uh, for Nintendo up 40%, Square Enix up 66% over the last few years versus a currency devaluation of 25%. Still outperformance for these Japanese gaming firms. SoftBank is unchanged, so it's actually down 2% for the last three years. But you could see that it is at the very least still strong versus the rest of the U.S. gaming market with a lot of U.S. games, um, U.S. gaming firms actually dropping huge. You've got Unity dropping 75% year to date. You've got Kingsoft Cloud, a Chinese-related name that helps a lot of um, gaming firms, like uh, and also your um, TikTok live streaming, down 70% year to date. C Limited, which is a Southeast Asian firm that has a lot of games like Free, uh, Free Fire, is down 70% year to date. Roblox down 68% year to date. So it's interesting to show to you that um, Chinese game related firms are, although they're down 40, 50%, they actually managed to stop declining. So you're seeing Agora, Douyu, um, Billy Billy, Huya. These have just uh, dropped by half versus Unity or Roblox. So there's a strong. Um, outperformance currently of Chinese related gaming firms, um, even the likes of Tencent, um, as well as watching a little bit of, um, uh, sorry, not really a little. With gaming firms dropping huge, you've got NVIDIA and AMD dropping 48% year to date. However, over the last three years, you could argue that semiconductors like NVIDIA and AMD continue to remain a growth name. Uh, NVIDIA rising 2.7x over the last three years. AMD still up 1.4x over the last three years. Value names this year have emerged, especially on energy and discount retail stores. Airlines are also outperforming with the reopening of the world and the easing of COVID quarantine rules. Exxon Mobil is up 40%. Cathay Airways, the Hong Kong airline, is up 35%. Take note that Cathay, Cathay, China Eastern, and China Southern all have been bailed out by the Chinese government. You've got Earthstone Energy, ConocoPhillips up 25%. You've got Chevron, Shell also up 20%. Funko is up 18% year to date. That is because Disney, um, Kevin, um, one of the, uh, sorry, not Disney's Kevin, uh, Disney's Bob Iger, um, the past CEO, has actually um, disclosed um, taking a stake on Funko, the toy company. Now you've got um, Kroger also up 4.5% this year. That is a supermarket. Uh, we know that Warren Buffett has a huge disclosure owning Kroger. Kroger is up 120% for the last three years and is managing to stay afloat this year, up 4.5% year to date. You've got Twitter, of course, outperforming because of Elon Musk trying to bid. You're seeing a lot of M&A in the sector. Um, Twitter is down 13% year to date. It could have been worse had there not been a white knight in the form of Elon Musk trying to buy Twitter. Airlines have been recovering. You've got also designer brands like uh, Nordstrom, also just down 6.5% and down 8% respectively. CVS Health is just down 10%. You're seeing that outperformance in terms of these um, discount retail stores as uh, people return uh, to their um, department stores, come back to offices and buy their clothing as well as um, just normal supermarket stuff. In terms of retail, it's a very different movement based on um, whether it is a discount retail store or if you are looking at shopping in general. Ralph Lauren continues to be down 25%. Tapestry, which owns Kate Spade, is still down 25%. You've got shopping department stores like Kohl's Corporation still down 27%. Macy's is still down 30%. H&M, although it is recovering this week, is still down 30% after a very good earnings report. 
You've got banks also down big this year, despite their valuations. Bank of America is down 30% this year. You've got brokerage firms down 25% for Charles Schwab. Interactive brokers is down 30% year to date. And a lot of your um, um, a lot of your shoe shops like Steve Madden or your clothing lines like Urban Outfitters down 30% this year. So even your clothing is dropping huge retail this year. Um, in terms of nickel, nickel has managed to still stay afloat year to date, up 8%. Take note that nickel has become a very strong commodity based on the electric vehicle sales demand. Solars are relatively afloat, just down 7% year-to-date, despite being very strong, 150% up for the last three years, showing that solar stocks as a whole have remained bought by the market, perhaps with the climate change and renewable energy being a strong secular trend voiced out not just by U.S., but also by China and Europe. Your high dividend yield stocks managing to stay afloat, they're down 10% this year, but they remain to be up 15% over the last three years, showing their relative defensiveness. Base metals are down 12% year to date, but still up 30% in the last three years, showing that it is still expensive to make um, a home. Um, any commodity has still gone up over the last three years since the pandemic. Now, um, in terms of mobile payments, mobile payments are down 30% as a whole year to date on average. Your semiconductors on average are down 34%. Cybersecurity stocks are down 25% year to date. Very much a lot of reds in the market. Chinese internet, however, have trimmed their losses. They're just down 10% for the year after dropping half by last year's standards. Huge drops in your um, semiconductors from Marvel, NVIDIA, AMD, Skyworks, ASML, Corvo, even Qualcomm is down 30%. So still no let up in terms of semiconductors. But from a three-year perspective, semiconductors have done pretty well, up 80%, 100% in the last three years. Big oil, of course, has made a huge comeback. Um after being down 60% for the last three years, they have surged more than 100% year to date and continues to stay strong year on year. Um, a lot of your NASDAQ short funds are also up 100% this year. Those shorting the NASDAQ, shorting the S&P 500 are up massively this year. Meanwhile, you're seeing that um, the Chinese bulls are already starting to recover a month ago, a week ago, and even from a daily standpoint, Chinese bulls are actually recovering. So that is the main story for the first half. Chinese athleisure outperforming your Nikes. Leaning and Anta is up 20% and 10% respectively this month. And actually bearing the losses this year just down 15% and down 20%. Nike remains down for the year, down 40% year to date down 20% last month, um, still struggling no? um, versus China. Lululemon has been pretty strong, just down 30% year to date, just down 10% one uh, a month ago. We're seeing outperformance really in China and Japan. Um, take note though, the Chinese yuan and Japanese currency have devalued um, for Japan. It's about, Japan has devalued at least 18% this year, 15 to 20% this year, 25% uh, for the last three years. China has started devaluing their currency 10% this year. So a lot of the strength of Chinese and Japanese stocks has to also do with the devaluing currencies versus the dollar. Um, your fintech firms, you've got resiliency on Visa and MasterCard versus your Buy now, pay later firms, a firm being down the, the most, down 80% year to date, um, as Apple, of course, has introduced your buy now, pay later. 
You've got companies like SoFi down 70%, PayPal down 60%. A lot of fintech innovative names like Block or Square is down 60%. Um, the ones that were relatively saved in the fintech is just Visa and MasterCard, which is also down 12% year to date. A lot of your biotech firms are struggling. All of these um, CRISPR, genetics, um, they're dropping huge. This year, Invite is down 85% year to date. Teladoc is um, the, the firm that helps people meet their doctors online and patient health cares online. It's down 60% year to date. You've got diabetes care firms down 60% year to date. So, um, a lot of drops in your medical aesthetic firms, like InMood, down 70% as well. A lot of these cancer plays, they don't have any profitability for the year. They're down massively, 60 to 70 to 80% year to date. Solar firms, the bright light, as I said, the strongest solar firm is Jingo Solar. This is the largest solar panel um, in, um, maker, manufacturer in China, Jinka Solar is up 50% year to date. You've got Enphase, the one buying from China and installing it in a lot of households, microinverters. It's up 7% year to date and up 10x for the last three years for Enphase. A lot of strength still on solar firms. Um, you've got Solar Edge still strong, 3x for the three years time span. Sun Power is up actually 1x for the last three years, even if it's down 25% year to date. So we're really seeing strength overall in the solars. Um, Canadian Solar is unchanged this year, still up 40% in the last three years. A lot of strength no, um, for solar, Sun Power, um, Sun Run. Although they are down this year by 30%, some of them down 20%. If you look at it for the last three years, they managed to still be an outperformer. And of course, Tesla in the last three years continues to be 14x. It's still up 14x despite being down 36% year to date. Okay, so <clears throat> given all these year to date um, movements in the market, what should you do? In the first half of 2022, we are actually. Um, discussing a lot about the inflation fears on whether we actually hit a harder recession or it is a soft landing recession. A few things to note, if you believe that the soft landing recession can be achieved, these drops of the market with at least 30 to 80% drops, especially in your tech firms, could actually be taken advantage. So First and foremost, let's take a look at your indices before discussing which companies we are seeing showing a little bit of bargain hunting. <clears throat> let's share the screens on the indices first. Okay, so we note the outperformance of Chinese stocks. Um, let's, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is tracking your Tesla, your Apple, and Amazon. They're all down 30%, 30 to 40% year to date. And you're seeing that the NASDAQ has dropped from 16,000 to 11,000. Um, from a year to date perspective, let me get the price performance here. Wait up. From the peak to the current low, you did get uh, a 35% drop in the NASDAQ. And while others are looking at a harder recession, a harder recession, they think it's about a 48 to 50% drop, would give you around 9,000. So in case you are looking to see how much downside the markets can have in a GFC type of crisis, from 11,000, you could still go down 20% for your Tesla, for your Amazon, and for your Apple. Take note that Tesla and Amazon, they have been just tracking the indices i.e. if you own the NASDAQ or if you own Tesla, it is still actually stronger to just buy a Tesla than the index because they, they move the same. Um, Tesla dropping 36% um, year to date um, and a 20% further downside from current 680 means that it could fall uh, 680 minus 20% is going to hit about 500 to 550 area. So in case you are of the view that the markets can continue going down, 
We believe that your downside is just limited here to about 549, 550s, and at worst, 490s. So just be careful of being too bearish as even a GFC type of crisis has shown that the index only drops 50% from its peak. So that's just about $500 for Tesla, not $200 or $100. You've got Amazon. Let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Amazon is currently trading at 106, 105. It is also down more than 30% year to date and has been um, just really tracking indices. So it's just down with the index. A further 20% drop gives you around uh, from 106 minus 16. That's about minus 20. So it's about 86 to 90. So just here at about 80 to 90, same level of your 2019 lows. So just be careful of being too bearish as we are sitting at a very, um, well, right now, even at a 35% drop of Amazon, you've got a lot of buyers um, retesting this $102. Take note, it has been retested about five times already for the year and has not yet dropped below 100, suggesting a lot of buyers continue to um, cluster on Amazon at the 100 area, or that's basically $2,000 after its 20 is to 1 stock split. We're seeing that um, strength in Amazon despite last week's numbers. We've seen the personal consumption expenditures. Actually, it was um, showing a rise, but it is a slower rise than expected. So you're already seeing a few signs of inflation slightly peaking. Take note that um, while crude oil is up 40% year-to-date and up 80% year-on-year, crude oil right now is steadily just sideways for the last um, four months from March till July. It is now just between 95 to 120 and is um, clustering here at about 106, 107 area. So we're seeing actually a sideways movement in oil. It is still, of course, in a strong uptrend over the last three years, i.e. we have a very high inflation over the last three years, 40 years, 20 years, and we do not expect to be out of the woods on that high inflation numbers. But what we are really just showing to you is that um, it is not anymore suggesting a $200 oil. Um, instead, it's more like a sideways action from 95 to 120, which could probably help the market which is um, still figuring out whether we'll have a soft landing recession or a deeper stagflation, a deeper recession, and so on. So if you're in the soft landing camp, you are starting to buy shares. But if you, if you are in the deep recession camp, the deep recession camp, however, um, is going to predict another 20% drop for the next three months. How would that be? How would that scenario become? That scenario, of course, will come, in my view, after earnings reports. A few things for you to understand. Amazon's earnings is end of July 28. Around those weeks, you will also see um, the Fed decide on whether they have to raise furthermore by September meeting, as the July rate hike of 75 basis points is also priced in right now by the market. So what could make the market actually go up and what could make the market go down will depend largely on the big tech earnings, Amazon, Apple being um, the real uh, big names that would um, trigger further sell-offs. So far, you're seeing Apple trade at 136. It is still trading in a range after dropping from 185. So most of your index names are just um, consolidating nowadays. It's not going down versus the June 16 lows of 130 for Apple. So we're just really seeing a sideways action. And in my view, the movement, as I said, will come around late July or early August when the numbers of Apple and Amazon start coming out. Apple's earnings come out July 28. So it's really more on the latter week of July. So next month, that's when the full unveiling of the economy will be shown. Where are the bright spots? So we said that oil and value names continue to emerge. So ExxonMobil, let's take a look at ExxonMobil. 
Exxon Mobil has gone up year to date from about $60 to as high as $100. After that, it pulled back down to $85. If, you're, if your view and our view continues to remain that this will stay high and remain sideways, that means you've got a trading range in your Exxon Mobil where any dips at $75 and $80 would be bought. In my view, your big oil firms have not really um, negated any um, any strong movements to the downside. What we've only seen is a pause on further uptrends. So a pause on further higher oil is a good news for the consumers, but it is, of course, not saying that oil is going to really fall down massively. We're just really seeing that a drop on Exxon Mobil is still a viable zone. However, your buys will probably be at eighty dollars, or if you're buying eighty five, it's also okay. Um, it's already at um, a fifteen percent decline from its peak, so you might want to actually nibble a bit on Exxon Mobil. And for those who are nibbling Exxon Mobil, take a look as well on Chevron. So these are the big three firms: Chevron, Exxon Mobil, and ConocoPhillips. Even your Shell. So Chevron has reached um, a massive rally from 115 to 175. Therefore, it pulled back now down to 145. So you're seeing that it's more of a trimming of the gains and more of profit taking after a huge first half. Um, strong supports can be seen 10% lower for Chevron here at about 135 area and 126. So we see that commodities are going to remain elevated, albeit perhaps in a trading range. That's why for those looking at nickel, um, nickel might actually trade at a high area, but just consolidate, um, pretty much consolidate at a higher range. So for those wondering whether the Philippine nickel company like Nickel Asia on what our view is, we think that you just have a trading range here with six pesos actually being a support and a lot of resistance at about seven to eight, around 20% to 30% range for your commodities is highly likely for the next six months as the world still grapples with how the commodities can be sourced um, as we still have production um, still limited. It's very difficult to um, just open a coal mine, open an oil drilling mine and so on. In terms of uh, commodities, I do have to share the movements of commodities. This is where most of the majority of second half gains will continue to emanate. So we actually are looking at three sectors, commodities, Chinese firms, sorry, actually four, commodities, Chinese firms, reopening themes, um, re reopening themes, meaning airlines, um, a lot of these um our restaurants like fast foods and department stores, that would be a few of those reopening themes, as well as solars, as we are seeing still strong, um, strong returns on solar firms. Okay, so from a performance perspective, let us take a look at um, the year-to-date gains. You can see that drilling firms like Bohr, Helmerich Payne, Hess, they're up 40% to 100% year-to-date. The smaller the company, the more the buyers. Um, if you are of the view that commodities will continue to be shipped, there might actually be some values on a 25 to 30 percent drop on a Chevron or EOG resources or even shipping stocks. So although they have been pulling back this month, they're very much strong over the last year and uh, year to date. So usually um, we would be taking a mild neutral view on commodities, um, seeing that it's going to be a swing trade. You buy it low and you sell it high, whether it be an Exxon Mobil, a Chevron, or even the shippers. So from the shippers perspective, let's take a look at a few of them. Let's take a look at Diana Shipping and Janko Shipping. So Diana Shipping has pulled back just like all commodities after seeing a per after seeing re recession, a deep recession means that there will be less and less demand for commodities, suggesting a profit-taking move. So Diana Shipping this year, after rallying from three fifty to seven dollars, yep, you've got a, you've seen a hundred percent rally. It has since dropped back to four point eight. I'd say that um, a drop near four dollars would be very oversold for Diana Shipping. And so any oversold drops of commodities might actually be bought already by the market.
If you're looking at leverage funds, uh, an oversold commodity drop in the big oil firms is seeing energy U drop massively. Take note that for this year, it's gone from 160 to 800. It was a 5x move and therefore it dropped back to 320. So far at one at 320, that is still up 100% year to date. And we are seeing that any pullbacks of energy U from 320 to 250 to actually be bought because we think that the market is still going to concentrate by ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and a lot of these oil firms on dips. So you're seeing that British Petroleum Shell is also going to be bought on dips. So still um, still look from, a, from an oversold perspective, if oil starts going below 99 or below 100, that might be your chance to buy some oil names into your portfolio. So we don't see commodities actually in a strong decline. We just think that it is a normal pullback after rising quite tremendously this year. So we talked about Chinese large caps also being a safe haven this year. Li Auto being the strongest name in the pack. Li Auto and Jinka Solar. So Li Auto actually right now has seen some profit-taking pullback from 42. It's now trading at 38. Usually, these dips can be just limited to 20% in our view, as long as it is a very strong trend. Um, so for Lee Auto, we are um, biased to be a buyer if it drops here at about 29 to 31. Same for Jinka Solar. The bias here or the momentum is still very strong, such that if Jinka Solar manages to drop 20% from 70, that would be around 60 or 50 you should be looking to take advantage dips on, on the Jinko Solar. Now, um, we talked about the super strong outperformers of the year. Um, we're seeing like airlines in China starting to recover. You've got uh, Cathay Pacific showing that strength. Usually um, in the first trend, while it is moving up, you can still wait for that pullback. So we're still waiting for Cathay Pacific from 860 to drop to 8 or sometimes below 8. Usually what I'll tell you is that um, since we are recovering from a bear market to a potential trend reversal in China, that recovery will be slow despite China easing their COVID-19 rules, easing the casino rules, extending the licenses. So we, we've generally been seeing positive news from China. However, um, it has rallied too fast, too furious as well for the year. That if you look to buy into China, you want to buy it only on dips. If it doesn't give a 20% drop, try to wait it out because just like oil has been dropping, it it is um it it is for the patient. No, we we believe that the trend for China and oil continues to be up. Um it is actually recovering. Um, a recovering Chinese demand is very bullish on oil, despite the worldwide recession being feared in the USA. So what we think is that China can actually save the deep recession um, and actually um, perhaps be more of a soft landing with China, of course, helping your Tesla and Apple. So if you are, of course, bullish in China, you might want to take advantage of Apple, Tesla, and even Disney that's dropping 30 40% year to date. So for Disney, this is an interesting um, chart support here at about $94. Not only has Disney fallen more than 50% from its peak of 2021, it's also trading at that seven-year bottom around the 2015 areas at $90. So um, Disney closes at $94, an interesting place um, for the next half of the year, as if China, if because if China actually manages to recover, like what the airlines are suggesting, um, in Chinese um, air, airports, like even the TCOM reporting generally good revenues, you might actually see a resurgence of a pickup on on U.S. names that have Chinese exposure, namely Disney, namely Starbucks, namely Nike, namely Tesla, and namely Apple. So those are quite interesting um, bargain opportunities, in my view, aside from taking a bullish outlook on oversold names in oil. Okay, um, let's, let me take a look if there's anything here. Okay. All right, so, okay. 
in general, um, as I said, we have seen outperformance in Japanese and Chinese stocks. This was mer merely brought about by their own currency devaluation, which we expect to continue. Take note that China and Japan are export countries, and what the world has not clearly accepted so far is that a devaluing Japanese yen and a devaluing Chinese yuan is actually very helpful for the world who is mostly importing. For instance, in the Philippines, we are suffering with the dollar strength, but thank goodness with the depreciation of the Chinese yuan, if the Philippines were to buy Chinese goods and pay in renminbi, if the Philippines were to buy some Japanese sushi or sashimi from Japan or um, buy some Chinese um, Japanese cars, it is cheaper for, from the Southeast Asian economies to buy it from these exporters. So those are actually a few of the good news that we could share. Another good news to be bullish upon for the next second half is that we have seen commodities somehow peak. It doesn't mean that commodities will reverse to the downside. We are only seeing a potential sideways action wherein we would still want to buy the oil firms, like the big oil firms like ExxonMobil, but we just want to buy it low and then sell it high. So it's a buy low, sell high movement for oil. Um, and that is good because if oil has somehow peaked, then it means that your inflation, which has went as high as 8.6% over the last month, could perhaps go maybe 8% or less next few months. So those are a few things to be a little bit um, more bullish upon, especially as a lot of your high growth names in the U.S. have fallen double what the averages have gone. So in general, for instance, we've seen Amazon drop 30, 40 percent. Um, a smaller counterpart like C Limited has dropped 80 percent, which is double the drop of Amazon. You might want to take advantage of those items because if the market has priced in a doubling drop, and yet these numbers, which came out actually for C-Limited, the numbers didn't fall to the downside, there's actually, in our view, a trading opportunity. So, so far, um, let me show to you what has been happening over the last few months. Um, a lot of the markets have been starting to buy a lot of high growth names that has dropped too much. So C Limited dropped 80% from 360. It has dropped to as low as 55 last, um, last May. This June, despite the NASDAQ falling, you are seeing actually C Limited re, re, uh, retracing the gains and retesting a higher low here at about $65. So from, six, uh, from 56 to 66, we are seeing that um, general uh, movement of a bargain hunting action. Um, what we want you to do is watch out for, um, for higher lows in the next three months because these growth names might actually prove um, quite um, a, a bargain hunting base, especially if you've seen their numbers actually go up. So C Limited had good earnings last May. Take note that there is an interesting dynamic here. Airbnb has fallen down. For the last three months, um, from the Mays of about 120, now it's dropping to 88 or a new low, despite the fact that airlines are suggesting um, full flights. Take note that this July 4, Delta Airlines CEO even had to um, write an apology letter for some flights being rebooked and being delayed because of just too many flights trying to um, take advantage of the July 4 holiday weekend. There's some um, we're really seeing um, strength overall on airlines. So um, we're seeing travel industry numbers show quite a strong recovery despite those deep recession headlines. So um, I would urge you to be more um, observant in the next few weeks, next few months, especially on the earnings, because the earnings, in my view, will, will either show a potential bottom in some of the stocks that have been going downside. Um, and of course, we are quite bullish in the China and the Japanese devaluation of the currency to help um, the disinflationary movement of the world. So, for instance, if the Philippines actually buys Chinese vegetables at a cheap rate, 
then um, it could at least solve the food food crisis in uh, in Southeast Asia so far. Um, those are a few things to watch out for. Um, a cheaper oil from Russia. Take note that uh, China has been buying a lot of these Russian oil um, as their partnership with Russia remains solid, um, which which allowed them to actually um, export their goods at a cheap price as well. So yun, um, those are a few things to take note of in a world that is very bearish. And that's your first half of 2022. We see a second half that is still bearish, but um, perhaps not as bearish. A further downside would just be limited to 20% as we have fallen quite the biggest over the last 50 years. This is the first half that has been the worst since 1970. So for others, it is an opportunity. Of course, it is sad, but um, it's usually true that others' misery is another's opportunity. So that's it. Goodbye.